Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the sermon today is the gospel lesson from Mark 10, verses 17 to 22, and the title is Every Man. Please pray with me. God, our Heavenly Father, you spoke through the prophet Amos and said, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Father, we hear these words and we give praise and thanks to you that you have raised up faithful servants like the women of the LWML to go forth into the world to care for others, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the lost. We thank and praise you for their witness and for their sacrifice and ask that you would move each and every one of us by their example, by your spirit, that we too should seek the lost, disciple the found, and care for all. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, would the ladies of the LWML please stand and be recognized? Yay. Hi, Millie. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Very good. Fantastic. Oh, and Ariana's got purple as well. Okay, very nice. Very nice. The gospel lesson today is not about a man who lived 2,000 years ago. It's not about a dusty story from the pages of history. It's about every man. In fact, this story in the gospel lesson today is you and I. It's what we do today, all too often focused on our works. We're going to take a look at the gospel and pick it apart. There's buried treasure in here. We want to look at it verse by verse, so we'll put it on the screens for you. As he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him a question. Now, as we'll see as we continue in this lesson, this was the the ultimate churchman. This is the guy who's at every function who supports the ministry of the church. This is the church person who has lots of friends, who's very nice, who makes sure that everybody feels welcome. They're friendly. They have tons of people they go up and spend time talking with, fellowshipping with. And this fine churchman runs up to Jesus in front of everybody and kneels down in humble submission before him in front of everybody and calls out, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The question itself is its own answer. He just doesn't realize it. It's its own answer because you can't do anything to inherit. An inheritance is something given to you, and you haven't done anything to earn it. Somebody else has earned that inheritance. Somebody else has worked hard to build up that which they then freely give to you, an inheritance granted because somebody else worked. Somebody else died. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's got it all backwards. He thinks his works, especially his works in church, gain him eternal life. Look what I do. Look how hard I work. I slave away for this place. He's got it all backwards. We can't do anything to inherit eternal life. We are saved by grace through faith 
alone. There is nothing man can do to work his way into heaven. There is nothing we can do to deserve or to earn salvation. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. The work is done by Jesus. Verse 18, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. This is the first of three attempts by Jesus to turn this guy around. He's got a lot of compassion for the guy. The guy is sincere, but he's completely backwards. So Jesus tries to pull his focus off of himself and turn it around to the Messiah standing right in front of him. Why do you call me good? Nobody's good but God alone, hint, hint. Jesus is saying, that would be me standing here Son of God, God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity, the Lamb of God, who's come to take away the sin of the world. Hello? The second attempt comes in verse 19. You know the commandments, Jesus says. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. All from the Second table of the law. Now, which one's out of order? It's the last one. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder is number five. Do not commit adultery, number six. Do not steal, number seven. Do not bear false witness, eight. Do not defraud. Okay, another way of saying covet. That's nine and ten. Honor your father and mother. That's number four kind of strange. Didn't Jesus know the order of the commandments? Of course he did. So there's a point to this. Look at him again. Do not murder. That's a work. In front of him is a guy who wants to be justified by his own works. He wants self-justification. Do not murder. That's a work. Do not commit adultery. That's a work. Do not steal. A work. Do not bear false witness. A work. Do not defraud. Work. Honor your father and mother. Ah, attitude of the heart. We are saved by grace through faith, not by our works, by an attitude of the heart that is submitted to God, by grace through faith, clings to the promises of God, and doesn't think it earns its way into heaven. But after this first and second attempt, the man responds, verse 20, and he said to him, teacher, because that's what he wants Jesus to be a guru of warm, fuzzy churchiness. Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Really? Wow. Probably even looking around for support from the crowd. Yeah, he's a good guy. Look at all the church work he does. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, which is great. It shows the compassion of Jesus. Could have clubbed him, but he loved him. You lack one thing. Here's the third try. You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. So you have, have you? You've kept all these since your childhood. You wonderful, amazing church worker. Great. You only lack one thing. Dump it. Get rid of your dependence on your works. Get rid of your material possessions that you cling to and you're so proud of. Empty yourself and be filled with me. That's the one thing you lack. Verse 22. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Strike one, strike two, strike three. Let this not be us. 
the temptation in modern American Christianity is to work and work and work and work and fellowship and fellowship and fellowship and think that's church. We overwhelm ourselves with busyness. We fall all over ourselves with kindness and friendliness. And church becomes a social club where we feel good about ourselves and our friends. Unfortunately, the real work of the church is not that and too often doesn't get done. And we tend to fall into the trap of thinking, as long as a program or a ministry benefits me or benefits my friends, I'm all for it. But if it doesn't, no way, not happening. That's not what church is about. And that's why I'm so glad we have an LWML, a Lutheran Women's Missionary League, a shining example since 1942 of how church ought to work. Each year, Lutheran women take little cardboard boxes and put in pennies and dimes and nickels, spare change. And God blesses these mites. And these little cardboard boxes of pennies and nickels and dimes become mountains of treasure, millions of dollars every year that are sunk into gospeling the lost and caring for the broken and the needy and the hurting. Here is a light among us, shining, showing the way, saying this is what church is. Sure, all the other stuff is nice, the fellowship, and my friends are there. Okay, great, terrific. But we are here to gospel the lost, to share Jesus Christ with them and Him crucified, risen, and ascended for the forgiveness of sins, for salvation, for eternal life. And that's what the LWML does. And you need to know that it's not just about saving up some coins and shipping them off somewhere to some people. Sure, that's a necessary thing, but real lives are impacted. And a huge difference is made in this world. And I'll give you an example because I just came back from Haiti and I got to watch, it was privileged to watch, seven Christian women change the world. It's important to tell this story because too often in the church, the women of the church are those we think of who make great casseroles, who clean up after the fellowship events. They're the people we can shoo the children off to because they'll take care of them, get them out from underfoot, mostly. Oh, there's so much more. Sure, they can nurture like nobody's business. But they can also rock the world. I want to show you some pictures from Haiti. I thought I knew what poverty was because I've been to Haiti five times and this was number six. And I've seen things I've never seen in the United States. I've had a lot of years of working with homeless ministry in the U.S. and people in poverty. And I've never seen anything like this. Um, This is Jubilee. Jubilee is a neighborhood in Gonaive. It's a neighborhood that is so poor uh, that people sometimes fight and scrap to the death over a bit of food, where children whose parents have starved and died uh, roam uh, trash heaps and pick through them for bits of rotten food because at least even that is better than eating dirt. These are houses that you're looking at. They're not sheds. That's not an abandoned factory. Um, Multiple people live in each of these buildings. And they don't live there because the 10-room stuccoed McMansion down the street wasn't available. Uh, This is the best they have. Okay? This is a typical street in Jubilee showing a house and a yard. Okay? These are houses lined up with this 
sort of corrugated that they've, you know, they've been able to pull this out of the scrap somewhere and make a fence out of it. Okay. There's a whole group of houses and uh, an area where children play. That's a, a, a common yard. Some more houses, the sticks for a fence. Uh, some more houses. In, you know, in the States, these would be sheds in our backyard. They're houses where a lot of people live. That's the road leading into Go Naives out of uh, Jubilee. That's actually starting to get into a little bit nicer uh, area. Typical house, there's actually two houses there. Notice the canal or the ditch running in front there. Um, that's where you dump your, there's no sanitation, there's no plumbing, no running water, no electricity, so you dump your trash there, uh, your, uh, go to the bathroom, and it just runs in front of the houses. Um, because there's no trash pickup and no sanitation, you throw your trash in a yard and, and burn it, and um, that's the kind of thing children will pick through to try to find something. Uh, more houses in Jubilee, people wearing just scraps of clothes all shredded. Now, I'm showing you this because this neighborhood never had the gospel before. And the Lutheran Church of Haiti um, decided they needed Jesus. There was a little bit of fear involved. Because in a neighborhood where people are willing to fight maybe to the death for a bit of food, you're not too sure you want to just kind of stroll in there. First of all, how are you going to get their attention? They're worried about this thing called surviving you know, and you want to come in and tell them about Jesus. So the church decided to begin with a medical clinic. They went in and they were looking for a place to put a medical clinic together to show by actual care what Jesus is about. The elder that went in to that neighborhood was so fearful he went in with a sidearm, with a, with a gun, to protect himself. He didn't end up needing to use it, but that's the kind of neighborhood it is. It's in that neighborhood that a tent was set up and seven Christian women from America walked in not even knowing the language and sat down and ministered to hundreds of people. Let's show the clinic. There's bits of cloth um, that they grab sheets and tied them up and made kind of a makeshift tent. Um, this is just one view. I was, I was there on Thursday in between teaching so I could see what they were doing. Um, and you'll see there's all kinds, just dozens and dozens of people. This is just one side of the tent. There, these people are packed in around four sides. You see, in Go Naives, there were three hospitals. Um, one run by Care International, which is a multi-million dollar American NGO and two run by uh, Cuban, the Cuban government. And um, Care International, I guess, has been having some money problems or something because they haven't paid their staff in, in months. And the people were continuing to work and continuing to work for free but reached a point where they couldn't anymore and they had to make a living somehow and they left. And the Cuban hospitals then went on strike in solidarity with the people who weren't being paid by care. So in a city of over 300,000 now, there's no hospital. And so around three in the morning, people started gathering around this tent knowing that the Christians were gonna be there. There was one doctor, there was one pharmacist, two nurses, and two uh, volunteers. And uh, there was a a male EMT, he helped out um, as well, but the, the rest, the whole thing was organized and put together uh, by these women, and also, of course, Helen was there. Helen and Cheryl were both there. Seven women walked in there and started caring for people, and they didn't stop until they were, these people were seen. Over 200 people a day by one doctor, a pharmacist, a handful of volunteers, a couple of nurses, seven Christian women. By the time the clinic was done, it was four days, Monday through Thursday, they saw 800 adults and 600 children. 1,400 people 
seen by seven Christian women. And they prayed with them, and they gospeled them, and they took care of their, their medical needs. Now, I wish, you know, this was all completely this awesome, you know, story that I could bring to you, but there's, you know, some reality that's mixed in with this. There's a, the grandmother with 11 children. She has a mentally disabled daughter who keeps having children because she has to eat and found a way. And so grandma is taking care of these 11 children. Now, this isn't the United States where there's Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and WIC and dozens and dozens and dozens of nonprofits. This is Haiti where there is nothing. So the grandma is trying to find a way to take care of 11 children. There are the twins that were brought to the tent, starving and dehydrated, that I wish I could tell you will be alive next Sunday. but I can't. It's important to understand the impact that you can have. And that's why we want to honor the LWML today and Christian women. You're not in any way, shape, or form second-class citizens. God works through you powerfully to make a difference in this world. You have no idea how many lives you impact. When you touch a child or care for a family and how far that goes, there's going to be a church built in Jubilee launched off the work of the hands of seven Christian women who went into a neighborhood where nobody would go a neighborhood so destitute that people fight over bits of rotten food. And seven Christian women had the guts to go in there and give them the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. This is what church is about. This is the real thing. We do lots of other fun stuff. Even here at Gloria Day, we have great events, great fellowship, and a wonderful family. And this place has heart. It's awesome. But let's always remember what we're really about. This is where the rubber meets the road. Seeking the lost, discipling the found, caring for all, doing what it takes to get the gospel of Jesus Christ into real lives so that immortal souls are saved. There are people who will not hear the gospel unless we bring it to them. In the gospel lesson, every man walked away. Let this never be you and me. And let us never be confused that the fun stuff of church or the busyness of church or the look at how much work I do of church, let us never think for a moment that's what saves. Jesus didn't die to give us busy work. Jesus died so that by grace through faith you're forgiven. You're saved. You have eternal life. These people don't go to Haiti because they think it's fun. They don't go to Haiti for vacation. They don't go to Haiti so that others can see their good works. They go to Haiti because they have to. They go to Haiti because they're saved by Jesus Christ who gave his life for our forgiveness and salvation and driven by that faith and driven internally by the need to share him. That's why they go. I've got one more uh, picture to, yeah, show you. There's Helen with a baby. Helen's always going to have a baby in her arms like a moth to a flame. Uh, this little guy, see how serious she looks? 
is six days old, and he's never eaten. His mother is dehydrated and starving, and he's never eaten. She can't produce milk. Now today or tomorrow or sometime this week, we're going to have a tough decision to make, all of us, because we're going to have to figure out which car we're going to drive to which restaurant to go out to eat. And it's a tough decision because there are so many. There's Tijuana Taxi, personal favorite. Flashback, right? All these other places. Now, I'm not going to tell you you know, what to do. But I just want to ask you that while you do that, if you'd think about this. He wants to eat too. What are we going to do about that? Let it never be said about us that we're the guy that walks away. Let it be said of us instead. What you sure can say about the LWML and their response, here am I, send me. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen.